Okay, hello. How's it going, everybody? Going to make sure that this uh, this good old stream is working. I'm not sure if it, it is working. There we go. There we go. We have done it. We have done it. Uh, we are live, and we're going to kick things off. Um, looks like we're at least 20, 30 seconds behind. Uh, I'm going to do my shares. And while I'm doing that, it would be very cool if you guys also shared um, the uh, the stream out to, you know, whatever, if you're, if whatever pages or groups or any of those things that you uh, might, uh, might be a part of. So, uh, that would be that would be super that would be super uh fun and exciting hi cindy how you doing uh and there is a little bit of a delay don't forget about that so there is a, a teeny bit of delay um i think it's like 15 or 20 seconds at this point but who knows it might uh it might <laughs> it might get uh, bigger uh we we don't in the, in the age of the quarantine, things are things are the way they are. So, uh, bear with me for a minute, folks. I'm going to share this out to a few groups um, and invite a few folks. Put this up in the in the weekly event that I have, um, and then we will uh, we will get right into uh, you know all the all the fun stuff that we're going to be talking about today. So I hope, uh, um, hope you guys are excited. Uh, if you would like to, uh, what 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 might be fun to do is I usually do a check in at the top of the show, um, and uh, and that's usually how I start these videos. Uh, it'd be cool if you guys left a comment about how you guys are doing. Uh, anything uh, you know during the week that uh, that you felt uh, was a point of accomplishment, a point of challenge. Um, you know, how, how are you guys doing? Le leave a comment. And that's, that's how we'll kick this, uh, video off by, uh, by you guys leaving a little comment and, and I will, I will put it up on the screen and, and we can kind of chat a little bit about that. Uh, if, uh, if that sounds, if that sounds like a fun thing, go ahead and do that. I'm going to share it to like two more groups before, uh, Facebook tells me that I'm not a real person. Because they do that sometimes. <laughs> Tell me that I'm not real. And then they get mad at me. All right. We're almost there. Share that link. Cool. And I will send out these invites to some people that I know pay attention to this stuff. I'll switch the banner as well so that you guys are just staring at me doing um you know just pressing buttons on the computer is all basically uh <laughs> that i keep doing um do see i know i had this okay Sorry, I had like a couple of names that I knew uh, I wanted to invite to this to the stream, and then I just hit a blank on them. Like my head just kind of completely went blank on uh, on people's names. So, uh, okay, we're almost done with inviting people to this thing, and then we'll get into it.
moving as fast as I can. I'm a one man operating machine, you guys. Just a one man operating machine. So I appreciate you guys bearing with me here. Uh, working my way uh, to getting every everything going. Okay, I think I have invited as many people as I possibly can. Um, so we got some comments. Cindy, hello. Uh, I'm doing okay. Uh, how are you guys? Uh, I'm, I'm doing pretty good this morning. I have uh, made my second cup of coffee uh, that I will be that I'll be partaking in while while uh, <laughs> we do this live stream. Uh, hi, Brenda. Uh, I am a big Spider-Man fan. Um, I, I I've been a big Spider-Man fan since I was a a wee wee child. Uh, so yeah, that's why I have I made that, and uh, that is a really old toy um, that I think I received when I was like eighteen or something like that, like way too, uh, way too, uh, old to like actually play with action figures. Uh, and this one's a badass one too. Cause the fingers move, the wrist, wrist rotates and stuff. Like it's a pretty, uh, anatomically accurate. Well, not, not all the way, uh, anatomically accurate, but, um, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I, yeah, I need to have, uh, I made the mistake there's of, of not having coffee a couple times this week in the evening and, and paid the price for it. So I'm, I'm making sure that I'm properly caffeinated to all this. Hello, Dolores. Welcome. Welcome to the stream. Uh, yes, I think coffee is, is imperative for it, for everybody to have at this time, uh, to, to make sure that we are staying awake through, uh, everything that's going on. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, please make sure, you know, you guys hit that share button, hit that like button, get as many people uh, onto the stream as, uh, as, as you possibly can, uh, because uh, here today uh, we are going to be looking at um, both of the Green Party candidates that are currently running for president, uh, considering that uh, right now uh, we have uh, an, an option of two uh, piles of just uh, corporatist shitwads uh, that uh, that's just being uh, you know shoved down our throats, and we're like, hey, this seems fun. Um, so I, uh, I I figured we should talk about um, you know some other options that we have because we do have uh, other options than the corporate two party system that is currently in place. And as as much as it, before, before we go on, if you're going to be one of those people that are like, the group party doesn't matter, third parties don't matter, starting something new doesn't matter, okay? Just vote for whatever you hold your nose and fucking vote for whatever. I said this on Friday is voting is not a fucking fish market. It's not. It's supposed to actually mean something, and you are supposed to actively participate in your democracy. You don't need to have this passive relationship with voting where you, you, know, where you pull a lever and then you go home and that's it, and then you're done right uh that's that's kind of not what uh what it's supposed to be you shouldn't be treating voting like a half-hearted hand job that's not what voting is supposed to be so uh and I'm, I'm saying this is somebody who just received the right to vote for 22 years i could not do that uh and now that i finally do um i you know it's always fun to uh join a, a republic at the very end of it it's always fun to just go down with it what it feels like to me getting my citizenship at this moment because i got my citizenship in um in december is i feel like uh i learned how to play the violin about four hours before the titanic hit the iceberg and joined the orchestra just so i could play the violin uh as the ship was sinking with the orchestra that's kind of what this feels like uh, so <laughs> I don't want that to be our options. So I'm, I, I want to, uh, talk about like what real viable options we have, and this is a real viable option. Um, so we are going to talk about that. And by the way, if you do leave comments, uh, throughout these segments, which is encouraged, I hope that you guys do leave comments. Uh, I will, um, I will put them up on the screen and at, at the end of the segment, I will put them up on the screen and we can kind of talk about the comments. So everybody kind of knows what we're referring to. So to Cindy's late to the party. I know I'm glad I became a citizen late to the party. Um, I don't, I don't know when would have been the right time 
uh, to be a citizen. Maybe, maybe, maybe 1955. <laughs> Would that be <laughs> like when Eisenhower was around and was like, "We should keep an eye out on the military industrial complex." I could have been. A, I should have aimed for aim for my citizenship with that one. <laughs> Uh, but I do, uh, you know, I, I, I will, I will, uh, I will pull up the comments there. So uh, let's uh, let's start with uh, with the first uh, of our options. Uh, the first Green Party candidate, if you don't know, is a gentleman by the name of Howie Hawkins, um, and uh, uh, Howie um, was a, he was a union organizer. He uh, has worked in various blue collar jobs. Uh, and has been part of the Green Party for a very long time. Uh, and he is an activist. Uh, and like I said, he was, he was an organizer, so he kind of knows how to do that. So, you know, for the people that were kind of excited that Bernie Sanders was going to be this organizer in chief, which is what he called himself, um, there is an option on the table uh, for someone who was a legitimate union organizer, uh, was a legitimate activist organizer. So that's kind of a that's kind of cool. Um, that's something that uh, that I think you could get behind. Um, now, Hobby, H Howie Hawkins has been a, a mildly controversial figure in the Green Party, which uh, we are going to get to the controversies that surround Howie Hawkins, and um, you know, in later in in some of the more recent interviews that he's done, he has uh, uh, how do I say this? Um, he has dispelled those uh, controversies a little bit. Um, so with, with, uh, Howie Hawkins, one of the biggest things that we're talking about in, in, uh, the current, uh, political landscape is the Green New Deal. That's been a point of conversation for, um, you know, at least, at least in corporate mainstream, uh, dialogue for the last two, three years. Uh, I think, you know, if you, if you pay attention to sort of the, uh, the more mainstream uh, political conversations. Um, the Green New Deal has, you know, AOC brought up the Green New Deal. And she uh, she kind of put it into the forefront. Uh, so now you had, like, you know, everybody from Fox News talking about it. Uh, you had people in CNN and, and, you know, like Nancy Pelosi was saying the word Green New Deal. But the Green Party has been talking about the Green New Deal for, I don't know, like a decade uh, a lot of the things that the uh, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party have been talking about, the Green Party has been doing for years. For years, they've been do talking about it. For decades, they've been talking about um, a lot of those things. Like uh, a Medicare for All has been uh, talked about by the Green Party for for a very long time. Um, the Green New Deal, uh, you know, LGBTQ rights, uh, racial rights, uh, income inequality. All this stuff has been uh, talked about by the Green Party for a very long time. Jill Stein, um, for you know uh, whatever you think of Jill Stein, doesn't really matter. But what does matter is the fact that she was bringing that stuff up even in um, 2008, 2012, and then in 2012 when she uh, was trying to get into the debates, they arrested her and then handcuffed her to a chair in the basement of the DNC. This is how the Democratic Party likes to treat third parties. Like they have this visceral allergic reaction where they're just like, oh God, uh, I guess we should just strip everybody of their freedom so that this third party doesn't get in. Like that's just how they, uh, they react to it. So, um, you know, but the green party, uh, has, uh, has always had a platform for the green new deal. Um, and with Howie Hawkins specifically, he has what he calls the eco-socialist green new deal. Um, and one of the ways, you know, um, that he wants to implement this moving forward is to ensure that um, ensure that uh, there is a transition state between uh, what we have now in the energy sector, which is primarily run by uh, the fossil fuel industry, by the coal industry, you know, natural gas, things of that sort. Um, to these renewable projects, to ensuring that these renewable projects can actually work uh, the way that they need to. So um, he's he would essentially create a transitionary piece of legislation that would say that profits from the fossil fuel industry would directly go into funding um, these renewable sources. Uh, and you know things like solar uh, uh, you know, have have been very highly regulated 
while things like fossil fuels and fracking and all of the like they have not been you you see um you see the way that they treat uh people that protest pipelines um you get they get cops they use water cannons sound cannons against these protesters that's what was happening in dapple um and even to even to this day uh, we still have um, laws and pieces of legislation in place that criminalize protesting what they call critical infrastructure. Uh, and they put they put people in prison. They put people in prison for protesting things like pipelines, protesting things like um, fracking drills, uh, uh, offshore drilling, uh, you know, uh, all these things that the fossil fuel industry does that, that you can get fined anywhere from you know, a thousand dollars to a hundred thousand dollars. And you can go to prison from one year to 10 years, uh, just for protesting, just for, um, exercising your first amendment rights. Um, so this, th this piece of legislation would essentially, uh, take away from all that and ensure that if you're, if you're making a shit ton of money off of fossil fuel, off of the fossil fuel industry, um, that you know that there's going to be a portion of that that's going to go into uh ensuring that renewable energies are going to be funded now you also talked about transportation because when you talk about uh, uh anything from the energy sector we have to talk about transportation because a lot of the way that we uh are transporting goods and transporting people and, and transporting each other uh that's also done by fossil fuels right like we put gas in our cars I, i'm i'm a road comic or yeah, I'm, I'm a road comic on hiatus right now. Uh, so <laughs> that's that's what uh, that's that's where I'm at. I'm, I'm a road comic on hiatus, but you know, I I depend on a vehicle to get from city to city. I get uh, I, I I use a vehicle to get from city to city to gig to gig, and and I unfortunately, you know, I can't afford a Tesla. I can't afford an electric car. Uh, that uh, that is that is powered on um, on, on renewable resources. Um, I have to use a, a gas powered vehicle. So, um, how do we convert something like that? Uh, we could completely convert the transportation infrastructure of uh, of the country itself. So, what he uh, proposes in that, and I think this is actually a pretty interesting idea, is you use airplanes. Um, and air transportation for more long distance stuff. So instead of having a, uh, a flight that would go from, you know, Pittsburgh to Philadelphia um, or, or even Pittsburgh to like Boston, which aren't very long flights and they probably waste a shit ton of fuel and a shit ton of fossil fuels in that, in that matter, uh, you would replace those with high speed bullet trains, which we can do. It would just, you, we would just, you know, have to build it. And again, funds from that would come from the fossil fuel industry itself using that transitionary piece of legislation. Uh, and we have the technology to do it. We have the technology to make high speed rail as part of our uh, transportation infrastructure. So this would replace what airplanes would normally do. And you could do it by nationalizing the airplanes. Howie Hawkins suggests nationalizing um, the air industry, especially now, the government could essentially buy it up, and uh, and you would uh, you would essentially only take flights from you know like if we're talking about Pittsburgh, you would take flights from like Pittsburgh to somewhere in the middle of the country or into the West Coast, right, or into the Southeast, um, something along those lines. But you would have these smaller high speed bullet trains that would take you to more closer cities, and then you could have um, light rails that would go to some of these smaller towns. And a good friend of mine um, and I were actually talking about this the other day. Uh, my friend Mark Viola and I were talking about this exact idea. Um, Mark was talking about this exact idea of, you know, going from something, it, it, Mark was in Houston at the time, so going from like Houston to New Orleans, that would be a high speed rail because these are bigger cities that could kind of hold that infrastructure rather than it, or, the, the trains having to make these small stops, right? Rather than the trains having to uh, go from Houston to Beaumont to Lake Charles to, you, it would never hit that speed. It, it wouldn't be an efficient way of doing it. So you would want those light trails. So again, this is very much uh, completely transform transforming the the way that we would um, we would travel around the country. 
Uh, and we have the technology to get this done. What we don't have is uh, the the will or the the politics to do it, um, because a lot of the politics is surrounding the fossil fuel industry. You know, politicians are paid off by the fossil fuel industry. They want to keep cars on the road. They want to keep gas stations open. They don't want to push you to uh, looking at alternative renewable sources of energy um, and changing the the transformation uh, ch ch transportation sector. So, um, you know, and, and this would also improve like rideshare programs, right? Like you could nationalize the rideshare programs. So if you get off, like, let's say you have a, a high speed rail that goes from Pittsburgh to Cleveland, you get off in Cleveland and you want to go to Youngstown or you want to go to Elyria, Ohio or something, you could, you know, you could get a rideshare program if there is not a light rail program uh, in place to get to certain cities and you could go there. So you know, you could pay a reasonable fee uh, to make that sort of stuff happen. And this is all by nationalizing uh, transportation, right? All transportation would be nationalized is sort of what he's um, he's proposing. Uh, another thing that uh, uh, essentially under that same idea of nationalizing this stuff, he's proposing that the, the federal government with public works as a public works endeavor, will construct infrastructure programs uh, like the electrical programs, uh, transportation, internet, housing systems. All of this stuff would be nationalized under a government program. Um, and if this sounds like this is crazy, it's really not. It's kind of what FDR was proposing back in 1944. Uh, the way that FDR was proposing it was by, um, by tr basically transforming the manufacturing sector uh, to... to um, help with armaments, right? Uh, they were getting involved in World War II. They needed to make a bunch of armaments. They need to make like planes, guns, tanks, that sort of stuff. So the transformation uh, transformation of the manufacturing sector was uh, pushed into war efforts. This is the same thing. This would be um, the manufacturing effort pushed to ecological um, and environmental efforts uh, because climate change is a problem and we should uh, take care of it. Um, and we're, you know, as much as the funds are going to be coming from that, fo from fossil fuel profits, they would also be coming from, um, more, um, by taxing the rich a lot more, uh, you, you know, you're, you're going to tax big corporations, you're going to place taxes on the wealthy, um, which is kind of what we need to do. Right. And, uh, one of the things that the Panama papers revealed, um, and, uh, you know, uh, Trump kind of did something, you know, basically it acted like this Reaganomics kind of thing in 2017, in December of 2017, I believe was essentially like the Panama papers got revealed and it was, it basically said that there's a bunch of offshore accounts, uh, and Delaware for some reason, Delaware is a tax haven. I don't know if you guys know that, but, uh, but that's Joe Biden state, Delaware, it's a tax haven. <laughs> <laughs> like, like they were just like well we don't know what to do with delaware is there anything fun to do in delaware and everybody's like no is that still a state has pennsylvania not absorbed delaware and they're like bah, fuck it let's just make it let's just say that there's no taxes that corporations have to pay in delaware if you if you're a corporation and you want to make a fake company uh hey come to delaware <laughs> like that's kind of what it was uh, but the Panama Papers revealed all this. And one of the arguments that's made is, well, why would businesses do um, any business in America if they're going to get you know, taxed a lot more? Why would they not go to uh, do business in, in China or hide their money in these offshore accounts? Uh, so he basically said, come and move your money in, you know, and, and make sure that you're investing in uh, American work and American factories and American manufacturing, and we won't tax you for it. So like, it didn't solve any of the fucking problems, right? Like it didn't fucking sound <laughs> like it's not a good idea to do something like that. So there is no other option, but to tax the rich. And if the rich don't, I mean, you know, it's going to have to come from a global effort of every country being like, yeah, if you're a big corporation, if you're a super huge billionaire, if you're, you know, a Jeff Bezos or a Bill Gates, you don't get to come into our country and just you, basically try to use this as as a uh, a tax haven to get away uh, by not, um, you know, 
by not paying your taxes, by trying to capitalize on on other people's uh, other people's labor efforts, by uh, essentially fucking over a different country's economy for your own personal gain. Um, so uh, part of this will also come from a federal jobs guarantee in the public works sector, um, and. Uh, with the, uh, with Howie Hawkins, what he proposes is there won't be an unemployment office, but there will be an employment office. Um, so essentially what he talks about is all these things that we're talking about by expanding the rail program, by um, re, uh, rethinking our air travel, by rethinking the way that we're going to implement renewable energy, solar, uh, geothermal energy, all this other stuff, right, is we're going to have to build these things. We're going to have to make, um, you know, solar panels. We're going to have to make solar roofs, uh, figure out how we're going to um, centralize or decentralize or, or, or create a, basically recreate this energy infrastructure that we would need, which is going to come from uh, by creating more jobs, by creating, by by basically having us be a part of the change that, that we're going to see. Uh, so these would be public works efforts, and henceforth, if you do have a, a federal jobs guarantee program in place, that would mean that a lot more people would have the opportunity to uh, join in on the workforce. Now, uh, to me, uh, you know, you can't have a, a federal jobs guarantee without having something like universal basic income in place. Um, it doesn't make sense to me um, because, you know, not everybody wants a job in the public works sector. Not everybody wants a, a, a federal, you know, a federal job. Um, so what do you do for the people that don't, right? Uh, this is sort of a way to veer away from automation that's coming. So let's say that you work in the retail sector and your job got automated or, or some of the, even some of these factories that we're talking about, some of the manufacturing efforts that we're talking about that uh, Howie Hawkins is talking about. Um, what do you do when, when that stuff becomes automated? Um, you know, and the jobs become a little bit more technically complex that you have to do a little bit more training for. Uh, so if you do implement a UBI, we are kind of getting ahead of, um, the problems that would be, imp that would come from automation itself, which our current government doesn't really do very well. Uh, the current government in places like when the problems come, we'll deal with them. Hence the, the quarantine situation that we're in. <laughs> like they were like when the when the virus shows up we'll be like hey uh maybe you shouldn't be here you know maybe if we ask the virus politely to leave it'll just go away and it's like okay you're an idiot you should probably have a plan in place so the, so uh, a ubi and a federal jobs guarantee program uh would essentially be that problem or uh would essentially be that solution to that problem and uh, how he does have this on his website uh, that he does uh, believe in a in a universal basic income, and uh, and I know we talked about this on Friday. If you tuned into the to the video on Friday, but um, with universal basic income, you also have to put in a universal rent control, which Harry Hawkins also uh, believes in and has on his website. He has some very interesting things that go along with the um, notion of universal basic income, but you need to have a universal uh, rent control. Um, you know, because now, I mean, even with the stimulus check that we, uh, are seeing that, that are coming through, right? Like we, everybody, a, a bunch of people got that 1200 bucks last week. And, uh, and, and of course there's going to be a bunch of landlords that are like, gimme, 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 pay my rent. You know, of course there's going to be a bunch of banks and mortgages that are like, gimme, 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 pay that rent. Remember how you got that money from the government, just put it back into the hands uh, of the banks that are essentially paying and controlling the governments through uh, lobbying and uh, and and paying off politicians. So essentially, it it doesn't it doesn't help us stimulate the economy. It doesn't help us stimulate small businesses. It doesn't help us help each other out, right? Like um, there are a few people that that have that are able to do something like that, but there's a lot of people that have to use that for rent, for bills, for basically. Uh, eventually that money going right back into the coffers of the banks who have already been bailed out with trillions and trillions of dollars. Um, so, you know, if we're going to talk about universal basic income, you have to have universal rent control. You have to have a way to say, um, you know, you can't just arbitrarily increase the rent by 60% just because you know that I'm getting a thousand dollars a month. 
which is actually pretty darn low for uh, for the United States. Um, but um, you know that has to be put into place so that so that essentially people don't try to exploit that. We have to have laws in place uh, so that the economy itself isn't going to try to exploit with the working class people that drive the economy. Um, so, so <laughs> because that's, that's what, that's what the system does. That's what capitalism does. Uh, it's an exploitative system, system of exploitation. Uh, so under the UBI, there's also uh, universal pre-K and child care, uh, and aid to public schools. This is actually, what's interesting is, um, nobody else except for Marion Williamson, uh, which I, uh, people got so mad when I called Marianne Kooky. And, uh, and I'm like, that's not even a bad word to me. But people, everybody got real mad at me. And they were like, how dare you, sir? How dare you use Kooky uh, to, to describe this lady? And, uh, and she's, I don't know, man, she's kooky. I don't think that's a bad thing. I'm not trying to insult the lady, right? Like, I mean, that is like a term of endearment. Um, I think it's good to be kooky. Like it's it that that means you're not fucking boring. <laughs> and, uh, and and Barry and Williamson had some interesting ideas. Not all of them I agreed with. Um, last August, I did a whole fucking podcast digging into the specifics of um, what Marion Williamson was talking about uh, and what her platforms were. And one of her platforms was to have universal childcare. Uh, she wanted to, um, and I think this is actually a really good idea. Is like have a Department of Child Care as part of the uh, as part of the gen the government administration. Basically, it would mean that it you know the, it, it would it would be an uh, it would be a, a way for the government to help families, the government to help people that have kids and you know have to go to work. Both both the, the mom and dad have to go to work in order to put food on the table. So what do you do? Okay, well, does that mean that now we have to, you know, take a portion of what meager living we're making to pay for a nursery, pay for a babysitter, pay for, you know, so it, it just kind of makes that system, um, you don't have to worry about that because the government will take care of that for you. You know, there there will be somebody looking out to ensure that your kids are taken care of. So, so she wanted to start a department for that. And, and it went into, uh, you know, a lot of the educational reforms. Um, that they wanted to make. Uh, so like like what Howie Hawkins is talking about, which, which is uh, aiding public schools, making sure that public schools um, are getting what they need, are, you know, where, where teachers don't have to um, d take a portion of their salary to get supplies. Um, and part of this too means that uh, we would have to completely reform the education system because the education system once again, is controlled by profit. Um, I don't know how many of you guys know this. I did a forkful of noodles about this maybe two and a half years ago. No, it was longer than that. I did it. I did it relatively um, after the 2016 elections. I did it relatively after the 2016 elections. But uh, I talked about how you know Texas controls a lot of what is taught in history classes because Texas has a shit ton of money and they buy books and, and the, um, the way that the book manufacturers are set up, um, states like Mississippi and Alabama and Louisiana, even, or, or New Mexico, a lot of these states down South can't afford that minimum requirement. So Texas will purchase a huge amount of these books, you know, they'll out, out, purchase these books and then they'll sell them to uh states like um louisiana and new mexico and alabama and mississippi and stuff right and texas will tell these publishers what they want in these books so they have this board of education that tries to control the narrative and 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 it's basically paid into it. They just pay into control the narrative. so you know that that way these states won't be able to do that and uh, if there is a problem with our education system, um, let's say there's somebody out there, like like one of the things that Texas wanted to do was cha literally change the word slave to workers, which is like, how much do you need to lie as a state? Like that's, <laughs> that's, 
that's so fucking crazy <laughs> that they wanted to do that. Um, and it happens on the other side too. The left, the the left also kind of try uh, wanted to do that with California. California was, you know, is a big state that that purchases a lot of books as well. So both sides were trying to do that, and you know, essentially, if if we if we make it a more centralized system, like you won't have to worry about that sort of stuff. Or that is the idea anyway, is that you won't have to worry about that sort of stuff. So public education, making sure that the public schools um, are getting what they need. Uh, it, it, the education system is, you know, being monitored. All this stuff, by the way, uh, that we're talking about means that we're actually going to have to participate in that democracy that we vote for, uh, that we can't just be passive about it anymore. Um, and I, and I know there's so many people that are just like, oh, if I just vote blue, no matter who, I can go back to that complacency where I can just sit back and not have to worry about anything ever again. And I can just I can just watch the Real Housewives of uh, Albuquerque and, and I can watch NCIS and not think about anything because they'll just make the and that's how authoritarian governments come into place, by the way. That's why we are in the situation that we are in, or partly anyway, is because we all got complacent. We weren't paying attention to what the administrations were doing. And if you really paid attention, you would see that the eight years under Obama were really uh, just a, uh, an authoritarian's toolkit. You know, the expansion of the wars, the expansion of the surveillance programs, the degradation of environmental reforms, the, the, the blatant lies that he would constantly tell the American people uh, you, we would have noticed that because we would have been paying attention. We would have been on the pulse of it. And I'm not saying everybody did this. Uh, there was there was a large population of America that kind of did this. And, and then when Trump happened, everybody's like, how did this happen? It's just like, well, 30 years of politics. That's how it happened. <laughs> uh, I mentioned this at the top. Obviously, they um, how he is for Medicare for all, uh, you know, it, this the treatments and basically under Medicare for all he he would he basically said that the treatments to the 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 COVID nineteen crisis that we are all in um, would have immediately been taken care of by Medicare for all it would have been covered uh, now Trump is doing something called the CARES Act that if you uh, if you are feeling the symptoms of it or if you do I think it's if you get control like. If you want to get tested for COVID or something, it's it's all covered. Just go to the hospital and get it taken care of. The hospitals will get paid for uh, by the uh, at the Medicare rate uh, or something along those lines. But you know, even if you have insurance, there's a lot of people that have insurance in this country that still are in medical debt. That you know, like medical bankruptcy in America is is a huge problem. And this the medical bankruptcy in other countries is not as rampant as it is in in America. Like you shouldn't have to think about, okay, do 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 I do I choose my prescription medication or do I choose lunch, right? Like that's not a choice you should have to make. Um, and Medicare for all would ensure that it's not a choice that you would have to make. Um, Another public works project that uh, that he would implement, you know, essentially talk, go, tying it back to that federal jobs guarantee idea is uh, making sure that uh, medical supplies and necessary medical items would be made throughout the country. Uh, we saw that whenever GE employees were basically saying that they need to be making ventilators instead of jet engines. Like no one's fucking flying and we don't need to make new jet engines. Uh, we need to be making ventilators. So they protested. Uh, they they went on like a short strike um, to to do that. I think they are. I think GE did did say that that's that's what they were going to do. Um, essentially, he would. Howie's idea is also to national uh, mobilize the national guard and the private sector to help take care of this thing to basically take some of the stress off of the um, the medical infrastructure so that they are not the only ones dealing with the brunt of it they have help from uh, the national guard the, uh, the the private sector and the and the pharmaceutical industries and they all kind of give up this notion of having profit in order to um, you know basically help this humanitarian crisis uh, he would not, you know, basically go in with the universal health care, nationalizing the health system. Um, and he talks about democratizing um, and having socialized health care, which would put hospitals and clinic clinics as publicly owned um, 
publicly owned buildings or, or publicly owned uh, services, right? Um, and uh, doctors and nurses and administrators that work for these hospitals would be federal employees, they'd be government employees. Uh, and the system would be overseen. This, I think, is 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 a really interesting idea, and I would um, I think this I think this might be the direction we should go with it. Uh, is the system would be overseen by locally and nationally elected health boards, um, one third by healthcare workers, people that work in the healthcare industry, and two thirds by the public sector, by 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 us, by we the people. Once again, this would mean that we would have to take active participation in the democracy that we're a part of. This stuff affects your everyday life. It's not, it's not something that you should passively throw your hands in the air and be like, somebody else would take care of. No, this means that we have to hold our elected leaders accountable for that shit. And we do that by taking, you know, by participating in all this, by engaging and having discussions in these ideas. Um, and this would also curtail the, the big pharmaceutical industries as well. This would ensure that the pharmaceutical industries have to answer to us because the way that they kind of go about doing things, these big pharmaceutical companies make trillions and trillions of dollars. Um, and they and, and right now they, they have no restrictions on price gouging or anything. They, they can set whatever prices they want. They can do whatever the fuck they want with that. Uh, and they literally, there was one that said, uh, there is no money in a cure. One of these pharmaceutical industries, the CEO of this pharmaceutical industry was like, we don't work with cures because there's no money in a cure. Um, they spend a shit ton of money in R&D, uh, research and development, but it's not in research and development of a cure because there's no money in it. What they do is, is a process called evergreening, which is changing the physical attribute of a drug uh, to restore the patent, to restore the copyrights that they get from it. That's what they do. That's what the research and development department is for that's why there's all this money funneled into it do you guys remember that uh that slimy worm uh martin scarelli the pharma bro uh that purchased that a hiv drug and was selling it for like 700 some odd uh, times the price of it especially to like countries that actually need it like africa and india which can't afford uh that that amount like that's way too fucking expensive for them to afford Pharma Bureau went on a bunch of news stations and was like, well, it's about research and development. We have to spend on R&D. Well, that's what he's talking about. R&D is more about how do you change this physical attribute? How do you change the color of a pill, the shape of a pill? The It's not about finding a cure. It's not about making the pill uh, or, or any of these pharmaceutical uh, drugs more effective to help you know reduce side effects or any of that sort of stuff. It's basically how do we keep these patents so that we can continue uh, making an astronomical, an astronomical uh, amount of money from it. So, you know, nationalizing the healthcare, Medicare for all, um, is something that would curtail all of this stuff. It would make it a lot easier for, uh, you know, for us to ensure that there is no price gouging, that by, by having locally elected healthcare boards, uh, you know, pharmaceutical industries don't get to buy their way into that sort of shit. Uh, now, Howie also talks about uh, he is for federal rent control. Uh, he's supportive of the uh, rent strikes. And we talked about rent strikes the other day, earlier this week. Um, and, you know, he cautions people of saying, hey, it just can't be you saying I'm not going to pay my rent. You got to make sure that you're organized get organized, get, make sure that everybody in your building, everybody on your, you know, in, in your apartment complex, um, understands what this is and are going to stay in solidarity. Uh, so, you know, if, if the landlord comes in and says, well, we're kicking you out for not paying your rent and tries to evict you, well, there's, you know, 28 other tenants that are going to surround that building, surround that apartment to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, there's strength in numbers to make sure that it's, uh, properly organized. Um, I will probably talk a little bit more about rent strikes a little bit more. Shama Savant did a, um, uh, if you don't know Shama Savant, she is the Socialist City Council member in Seattle uh, that has literally brought Amazon to its knees. Uh, so she's fucking rad as fuck. Uh, you should definitely know who she is. Um, Shama Savant has talked about like organizing rent strikes and organizing these um, uh uh, rent freezes essentially and how to kind of go about doing them. So I'm going to uh, look into that and, and talk about that uh, later in the week as well. Uh, so 
he talks about, uh, let's get into ballot access for the Greens. And this is sort of the, the, the big kind of pushback that anybody that talks about third parties gets is, well, they don't have ballot access. How are they going to get ballot access? Uh, and it is a problem because uh, what people don't realize, what people need to realize is that the DNC is a for-profit company. It's a for-profit corporation that controls the election. So is the RNC for that matter. Um, in order for uh, in order for the for for any third party, this is different from state to state. Is they need to get between one and three percent of the votes in a presidential race in order for them to get ballot access for down ballot um, elections. So even for them to get, um, even for them to to show up on the ballots uh, for congressional races for gubernatorial races, for mayoral races, for, uh, you know, House of Representatives, city council seats, whatever it is, um, they need to get, you know, one to three percent in a presidential race to get just show up on the ballot. Uh, there are other ways of going about doing that. Um, now, I know there are other ways for going about doing that, um, but this for for the green party seems like this is the uh, path of least resistance so to speak uh even though there is a lot of resistance to it um and it does sound like it's a um it's it's a it, you know an impossibility to reach um but i don't think it is i think if you look at the amount of people that are from the Bernie movement, especially young people, especially people in, in my generation, um, and even even some of the older folks that are just tired of the bullshit, you know, um, I think that you know, voting for the Green Party, at least to get them that ballot access, is good. And getting organized around some kind of a third party, some kind of a new party uh, that is less corporate and, uh, you know, less corrupt is is a good thing is what we should be looking at um and the dnc has built this particularly to block third party access and then they basically use propaganda bullshit to scare people in order to not vote for the third parties you know they they kind of they, they make it a lot more difficult for the third parties to get ballot access uh i remember travis irvine um who ran for the gov uh, gubernatorial seat in Ohio as a libertarian, which is a, uh, you know, and Ohio has a pretty strong Republican presence, uh, went and basically had to fight for ballot access. Uh, they, they had to do a signature campaign, he had to do uh, a bunch of different stuff, and then they finally did it. They, they pushed back and they got on the ballot. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it, it's all stacked up against them. They have to do so much more. And, that, and, and here's the thing is, while he was trying to get ballot access, he could have just been campaigning. He could have just been a part of the race. Um, but that's not how the RNC and the DNC have it set up. And then, and then they use the, the propaganda machine and the corporate media to essentially, you know, talk shit on the third parties, you know, uh, use McCarthyism and all this crazy shit. And they scare people, you know, and they and they sit there and say, um, you know, if you if you don't vote for this, then it's all going to go to hell. The whole country is going to fall apart. It's all going to get destroyed. Uh, you know, it, it, do, do you want fascism in your country? Then don't don't want more choices like it's these ridiculous hypocritical statements that they make. Uh, and both the Democrats and the Republicans are all paid for by the rich. So and, and the party itself is paid for by the rich. Right. And and everybody talks about the delegate process. And there's been several times in history where uh, the candidates basically realize that it all comes down to the delegates. It doesn't come down to the actual uh, populace like us voting doesn't really it doesn't really come down to. So it, they just straight went to the delegates and it like fucking caused riots like people got pissed. Uh, you know, so they, they kind of placate to the to the public and, and you have parties like the Green Party, like the Libertarians and any other third party, really. Uh, that doesn't take corporate money and is directly looking for for us. Now, um, the controversy that surrounds Howie Hawkins is around RussiaGate, uh, which was essentially this nonsense McCarthyist bullshit that ran around for 
you know, three years that was proven wrong. And then the Democrats essentially co-opted that to, uh, um, you know, basically be Russiagate. They were, they were essentially like, oh, obstruction is Russiagate. And, and it's like, no, obstruction is not Russiagate. Uh, uh, obstruction is not collusion. Him, him uh, breaking the emoluments clause is not collusion. You know, all these things are not the same thing as collusion. Uh, that was never proven, and they still kind of ran with it. Uh, I'm not saying that Trump is innocent by any any means. Um, I think you know he's just as corrupt as any other president has been in the last you know 30 years or so. Um, but he kind of uh, he kind of flippantly said something in an interview, and the progressive community kind of caught wind of it. And it was this very disappointing thing for them to learn. Um, and uh, Russiagate is essentially, it's been weaponized against a lot of different movements. The CIA specifically weaponized it against uh, the DAPL protesters, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and uh, it, even, even other Green Party members. Uh, it was levied to Hillary Clinton said that Jill Stein was a, was a Russian agent with absolutely no fucking proofs, right? Uh, when what they don't talk about in terms of election interference, in terms of election manipulation, is the huge amount of black voter suppression that happens uh, that even the Democrats have participated in, uh, where where they know that there is a majority, there, there's a portion of the black community that will vote for Bernie Sanders. So they either move the polls, close the polls early, uh, you know, just don't count the votes that come out from those polls. Uh, and then the Republicans have been practicing it forever, right? Gerrymandering. Uh, there's uh, uh, the 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 interstate cross check program, which literally takes voters out of the counting system. So there's just a bunch of voters. If you have the same last name and you live in two different states, it will just take you out um, of the uh, of the process. Now, if if the other thing is popular vote, right? Everybody talks about how Hillary Clinton had the popular vote. Uh, he talks about ranked choice voting, which is something that I'm I'm also planning on uh, looking into a lot more because I have heard about I know a little bit about ranked choice voting, but not as much as I would like to. Uh, he also addresses traitors over cyber warfare, which is you know the intelligence wars that uh, uh, that are happening where the, the basically America practices what they are claiming Russia does. Uh, they they also go into different countries. Like and they've and they've done this a bunch of different times. Like Venezuela is one of these countries that they've done, where they essentially create this opposition movement to the uh, the more popular party, and uh, and 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 they run with it, and they use that opposition to try to co-opt votes or try to manipulate and sway votes in different directions, um, and control the electoral electoral process of a different country. Um, this is also going to come from media reform by reforming the media so that they're they're held accountable for the shit that they say, where you had people like Bakari Sellers just making outright flippant remarks of, you know, the, like McCarthy's remarks of saying that uh, Tulsi Gabbard is a Russian agent. What's the proof? Well, she just is. That's not proof. And like CNN and MSNBC just ran with that. Uh, public funding of investigative journalists is something that he also believes in to kind of combat this hysteria that comes around from it as well. Uh, which we need. We need more investigative journalists uh, in, um, um, you know, in in our society as well. Uh, so part of the 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 way that he wants to build the Green Party, as I mentioned at the the very top of the video, is that he is a organizer, uh, is having local chapters fall, funded by rank and file members. I think this is kind of an interesting idea. Uh, and, and essentially run it like. Uh, run it like how a union would collect dues. So there are going to be local chapters with local re leadership um, and um, and you pay into that and you, you know, and you make sure that there's people that you want representing your voice in the local chapters and the national chapters. Uh, and, and this would circumvent the need for um, private or corporate money to come into it, right? Um, and this also means that it would create a more informed populace. It would create people that are actively participating in their democracy. A lot of, I think a lot of what Howie Hawkins has in place, and I think this is sort of the strength behind what he's saying is, it, it is a lot of active participation, which I do like about what, what a lot of what he has to say. Um, so 
you know, a lot of interesting things. I, I would also highly recommend like you go check out interviews with, uh, um, with Howie and um, you check out some of the stuff that he says. The Russiagate thing was a little, you know, disappointing to see, but he has somewhat dispelled some of those uh, rumors and hopefully he sticks to it. Hopefully there's no more, um, no more kind of um, support of, of uh, these McCarthyist attempts and we can actually like properly um, look at the corruption that is uh, in not just not just a Republican White House, but also Democratic White Houses. We, we, we need to be able to hold both these parties accountable. Um, and that's that's what a lot of the principles are, is is we need leadership that's going to be accountable to us. Uh, so with that said, uh, let's see what, uh, what you guys had to say. Cindy, uh, I was a Bernie delegate at the Texas Democratic Convention in 2016. That's where I learned that the Democratic Party is not Democratic at all. Uh, the Green Party held their convention in Houston the following month, and I went to San Antonio for the DNC. Uh, that's where I learned about the Green New Deal. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I heard the term Green New Deal. Um, maybe, maybe until after the 2016 election. Uh, that's when I first heard about the Green New Deal. Uh, and it was like stuff that I had already kind of like agreed to. It, it's it, it's always nice to kind of have all your ideas just put into like a nice little section. <laughs> and that's kind of what the Green New Deal wind up being. Um, Delaware having, yeah, they have a lot of shell corporations in Delaware, which is so fucking weird that they would choose Delaware of all the states. Cheryl, uh, I'm a small business landlord. I own four small units. I still have to pay bills and mortgage. My income comes from uh, my rent. I'm almost 59 years old. Not all of my rent goes to the wealthy or to the banks. You're, I would say that you're, you're, uh, you're probably, uh, you know, a um, uh, outlier in the in that situation. Uh, and one of the things I, I did a whole video on uh, about rent strikes, about what that means. Uh, about kind of being organized and, uh, you know, essentially the idea was also that it would have to also come from the landlords themselves, uh, having a mortgage strike in order to make sure that these banks aren't, um, trying to take advantage in this time. Uh, you know, um, I, I kind of had to go through something similar with that, with my car payments. I know it's not the exact same thing, but essentially requesting a freeze and they said that they would and they're and I just got a letter saying that they're going to charge me a bunch of interest which I was told that they wouldn't do right uh so it, it it's it, we need a freeze on all these sort of things because there is a large portion of this country that's just not making an income right now uh, and until th that sort of issue is is um uh you know taken care of it, it's going to be very difficult to do this. I, I'm not sure, you know, how how your tenants are handling the situation. If your tenants have had to deal with um, any sort of, uh, you know, income freezes or anything like that, um, so I shouldn't have to mow the property, repair the property, or attend to my tenants' needs. I'm not saying that. Uh, I'm 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 saying that this it's difficult. It's difficult. The, you know, and, and a rent freeze is essentially, I think a bunch of people saying that, Hey, we can't afford it. And asking us to pay this thing right now, uh, and put, and, and basically, basically putting the option to either, uh, we pay for this thing or we're out on the streets seems like it's pretty extreme decisions to make here. Um, so I think, having a little compassion for everybody involved, um, including the landlords. And that's why it's, that's, that's why one of the things that I did mention in my rent strike video was, um, that it would, uh, you know, having landlord solidarity would also probably push, uh, push the government to, to, to make a decision on this, uh, that would be helpful to everybody. Realistically, what, what you are, like you mentioned in your earlier comment is that you're a small business landlord, you're a small business owner. Uh, a lot of these issues are coming from bigger, uh, what are they called? Um, they're not retail. Why am I losing these words? Uh, real estate, real estate, uh, bigger real estate companies, uh, that own, you know, multiple properties, they own big buildings. They're essentially big corporate, uh, real estate companies. 
that are uh, that are charging people rent, that are putting eviction notices in place, and things of that sort. And that's just uh, to, to me, that just is not isn't fair. Um, that and it, it doesn't show that you have an understanding. It doesn't show that you care. Um, it doesn't show that anybody is really part of any sort of community. Um, and I would, uh, my guess, you know, with, without really knowing much about uh, your business and what what you're going through, my guess is that by owning small small four, four small units, that you kind of have a community uh, that 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 is built around the properties that you own. Um, so you know. Um, uh, like Cindy points out here is my landlady is operating as a small business. Uh, she fills a, a much needed niche in the community. Yeah, I think small businesses do fill uh, that niche uh, in the community. And, and it's sort of that controversial topic, right, is is what do you do? Uh, you know, how do we kind of handle this sort of a situation? So um, it but it's a, it's a much needed conversation because May 1st is going to roll around and there's still a bunch of people that don't know how to pay their rent, that don't know how to handle that situation. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I think it's an, it's an important topic to, to uh, keep in mind. And it's an, it's an important topic to figure out how to address, especially in this sort of a situation. Um, you know, when, when there, we have what, close to 30% uh, of, the, of the country um, that is uh, applying for unemployment. We're, I mean, we're heading towards depression territory here. Um, you know, so uh, it's it, it makes it a lot more difficult. Thankfully, starting a new law, new job. Congratulations, uh, landlady has taken partial payment and agreed to let me pay this month's balance about two weeks late. I've been trustworthy tenant. I'm sure she's handling. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think case by case basis is probably the best way to do it. Uh, I've seen some things where there are landlords across the country, you know, small business landlords that are like, hey, don't worry about it. We e even if you can't afford to pay your rent, uh, hold on to it because, you know, maybe in two months or so, if this thing still is going and, you know, uh, the landlords need a little supplement to the to the rent, then we'll come to the people that can afford it. Um it's bringing up a lot of questions. It's bringing up a lot of questions that uh, we probably need to, needed to address quite uh, a while back. <laughs> um, so yeah, and, and uh, Cheryl, if you're still watching, um, I did do a video about rent strikes. So I'll probably be doing a follow up video uh, in regards to that. In regards to what, uh, like I said, Shama Savant was talking about earlier this week. Um, so uh, if you if you if you have the time, if you if you are interested uh, to 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 see more in depth about what I had to say, please check out that uh, that video. But uh, we are going to move on to our second candidate uh, for the Green Party. This, this is the only other candidate that's uh, running for president of the Green Party, uh, Mr. Dario Hunter. Um, Dario is, uh, from Youngstown, Ohio. He lives in, he lives in Los Angeles now, uh, but he's from Youngstown. He's an environmental activist. He was an environmental attorney. He was an educator. Uh, he's got a bunch of law degrees. Um, so he kind of knows, um, that end of things there. Uh, and, uh, he, he, you know, again, the Green New Deal is is sort of the forefront of uh, the conversations that that uh, that people seem to be having with um, with the Green Party itself, and uh, he has something called the Green Path Forward, which he talks about having uh, diplomatic re realignments to rebuild relationships with country um, that are also you know creating a lot of um, environmental problems uh, through you know, the rise in manufacturing in these countries, the rise in um, agricultural developments in these countries like China and Russia, and we've created, and we've essentially deemed them a threat. Um, they, and creating a diplomatic uh, realignment with them, talking to them about, you know, hey, this is how we think we should move forward. This is what would, um, this is what would kind of uh, help us, uh, you know, as a global society, create a better place uh, for everybody to live and essentially uh, make this planet healthier for everybody to live. Um, 
he essentially wants to approach it diplomatically. So as much as, you know, how he talks about opening up transportation um, and nationalizing it, all good ideas, all, all ideas that I think I agree with. I think this is some, this is an interesting, different perspective uh, that I don't think is, is particularly in uh, Howie Hawkins plan is this notion of the green path forward by approaching the green new deal on a diplomatic scale. And I think that's a really, really good idea um, because as much as, as much as we in the United States want to look at renewable sources of energy, want to look at transforming our transportation needs, um, we should be talking to other countries. We should be learning from other countries as well. We should be opening up diplomatic talks. So if Sweden has a way that they implemented um, solar energy, oh, cool, let's, let's figure that out. If, even if China has a way that they implemented uh, certain agricultural um, you know, solves a bunch of agriculture. Great. Let's talk to, let's talk to them about it. We should be learning about it. This really takes the hubris out of that American exceptionalism um, that I think has held this country back, quite frankly. Uh, he also talks about plastic production. Uh, how he touched about um, the, the, the videos that I watched and, and the things that I've read on his website, he touches on the plastic productions. Um, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I talked about uh, just how terrible the plastics industry is. Um, and, you know, I, I used to get made fun of because I, I saved these glass bottles, right? Uh, uh, this is this is a, a, a sauce. Uh, and I saved them and then I drink water out of them because uh, I don't want to, I don't want to create waste and I don't want to use plastic bottles. I fucking hate it. I hate it. Uh, I'm, I'm staying at my parents' place and they have plastic bottles here and it's, um, and it's, uh, uh, such a goddamn pro I hate it, <laughs> but plastics, is, it, it's, it's a huge issue. And it is an issue that relates back to the fossil fuel industry because it is made with oil. Um, that, that is, that is part of plastic production. And there are actually, um, there are actually different alternatives to plastics. And when I did this video, I want to say two years ago at this point, uh, I talked about one of the things was fungus. There's a lot of research going around using uh, using fungus to to uh, as a plastic alternative. 3D printing, especially, it, it, you know, uh, as as an alternative to plastics. Um, but uh, one of the research with with fungus is mycelium. Mycelium is is what the fungus is called, uh, and and it's basically they they create these huge. Um, how do they even say it? I'm forgetting what the actual thing is, but they make these like huge sheets of these myceliums um, and they heat them and um, heat and cool them. So they become more pliable and then they can like ply them into whatever shape that they need it to be. So, you know, it can go from based on how you, how pliable you make them and how you grow them. You can make plastic, you can make bags out of them. You can make uh, bottles, furniture. Uh, and I'm sure you know, because because we are uh, we are human beings. Uh, condoms condoms will be made out of mycelium uh, because I don't think human beings um, are going to stop until uh, we've ejaculated and everything. I I think that is uh, uh, that is that is a goal that it, it's just I think that's a, just a very animalistic way of just being like I'm I'm going to show my dominance to nature. Fungus can't it thinks it's bad. Why? I'm gonna come in fungus. That's what I'm gonna do. That'll show the fungus. Uh, because we're all still primates. So <laughs> but it is uh um it is this kind of like amazing alternative and it's biodegradable. Uh so like you know, I I take walks everywhere and I still see people fucking throwing like aluminum on the side of the road, you know, plastic bottles on the side of the road, and that shit it's just fucking horrible. Uh so with this, if you make bottles out of mycelium because they're highly biodegradable, they um, they will biodegrade into the ground a lot faster, and it's actually good for the environment. Uh, so it, you know, if we move to this and make this part of the mainstream conversation, it will be mandatory for us to litter. To save the environment, we're gonna have to litter with mycelium. We're gonna have to do it, you guys. Uh, so you know when. In the future, when when you see condoms on the side of the road, it's just like somebody is 
is is helping the environment uh, and also trying to dominate it at the same time, uh, which, which is gross and heartwarming all at the same time, all at the same time. Uh, one of the things that, that Dario talked about um, was environmental racism. He was an educator, uh, so he got to see some, and he and he was a, a you know fought back against the, the the fossil fuel industry that's very present in in the uh, what is this area called the Allegheny County area uh, the 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 Rust Belt of Ohio area kind of that that area I, I don't I don't really know how to like d d describe this region. Um, but he talks about environmental racism and, and basically what he's talking about is, is these are areas where corporations and politicians and big businesses kind of treat these places like shit. Uh, they don't really care about what happens. They pollute, uh, a lot more. Um, they, uh, you know, basically degrade the environment a lot more and they kind of don't care and they don't really talk about it all that much because, you know, it's primarily low income people. It's people that, uh, you know, don't have, uh, that are brown or black, uh, that don't have a lot of money. And, and essentially what he's talking about with environmental racism is corporate sacrifice zones. Uh, a lot of different cities have become corporate sacrifice zones where, where it's essentially like you're dumping like nuclear waste and it's like, it doesn't matter because it's a bunch of poor black people that live there. So who fucking cares? Um, and he's from the, the the Youngstown area, so he talks about uh, what like the the fracking company specifically turning Youngstown into a corporate sacrifice zone uh, because Youngstown experienced something that no city in that area should experience, which is earthquakes, like registrable fucking earthquakes because of fracking, because they're drilling into the ground, because they're taking you know shit from uh, that 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 shouldn't be taken. Um, from the earth out of the earth, essentially. Uh, and one of the, he's fighting blue dog Democrats. That's what he spent his time doing when he was in the Mahoning County area in the Youngstown area. Um, as he was fighting blue dog Democrats on a city level. And essentially what he talks about is these blue dog Democrats are people that come from the, uh, the suburbs of Youngstown. And, um, Part of the thing that he wanted to do was talk to people of di from different backgrounds, but these blue dog Democrats were, it, it, they would always get uncomfortable when, when he talked about fo the fossil fuel industry um, and really restraining corporations because to them it was scary because, oh no, what if the jobs go away? What if you put these rules on corporations and they can't, uh, you know, they can't be as greedy as they want to be and then they go away? Oh, like, so they would never push back against the corporations and they would let the corporate, like G there's like a GM plant in Wardstown, which I've driven past several times. Uh, so when he said that, I knew exactly where the fuck it was. And, uh, you know, they're, they're just scared, but who he's talking to are, are, are the working class people, not, not particularly these blue dog Democrats. He had to push back against the blue dog Democrats. And one of the things that he talks about is, uh, and this is sort of part of the challenge when you are in a community like Youngstown, when you're in the middle of the country, is um, the problems on an economic level that, you know, a factory worker from the GM plant would be facing um, or, or the problems that somebody in the south side of Chicago in a particularly low income uh, uh, neighborhood of color, per, for example, um, you know, on a fundamental economic level, they are the same challenges, but how you are going to go about solving those challenges is going to be a little different. And we, and, and that has to be acknowledged, um, that, you know, for low income communities of color versus low income communities of, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, white working class people, fundamentally they are similar, but you, there, the execution of how we might come arrive to a solution to help with those problems are going to be a little bit different. Uh, and, you know, he talks about the different ways of handling that. And that's sort of what the Green Party has. Uh, to, so to him, of, of the, the question of how do we get people on board with the Green Party when, you know, the chips are stacked against us? 
uh, is he talks about the messaging of the Green Party being comprehensive, comprehensive in the values and the platform. And really, this and this is that this is that similarity, right? When you're talking to a blue collar worker from Lord, from uh, GM, and you're talking to someone from a low income community of color in Youngstown that has been affected by fracking. Both of these communities are affected by fracking and, and corporate um, corporate takeovers. Is that messaging of comprehensive reforms, comprehensive messaging, and and the Green Party really being a party of justice, both on a economic level, on a racial level, on a planetary level. Uh, they are the party of justice, um, and they're the party of listening. They're willing to. The the Green Party is a party that is going to sit down and listen to what you what what you have to say, and not um, not just throw out a bunch of policies at you. It's because that's not what they care about. Uh, they're worried about their family. They're worried about their jobs, and they're worried about how somebody is going to to help them on, on somewhat of an immediate level. And, and to me, what I kind of got out from Dario is this, this notion of just being able to sit down and say, yeah, this is all scary stuff. I, I'm, I'm also worried about all these things and connecting with the, with the people that way. I think it's, it's a little bit more um, compassionate of, of a, an approach uh, than Howie Hawkins, in my opinion. Uh, and I kind of really like that about him. Uh, it, you know, how he's an older, older guy. Uh, well, definitely older than, than Dario is. Um, and to me, I kind of got uh, a little bit more of a stern, you know, this is how it is. And, and kind of a talking down to uh, a mild level of condescension, dissension from Howie. I'm, you know, that's just how I felt about it. Um, you know, and by, by no means am I saying that's how you need to think about it. That's what I got out of it. That's part of the, And the reason why I like Dario is, is, is that approach of compassion, that approach of, of saying, we're going to sit down and listen to you. And we're, we're going to try to connect with you. And we're going to try to understand what your problem is, because as he said, we have to understand that fundamentally these problems, uh, are are coming from the exact same place, but the way that we're going to execute them are probably going to be different based on, you know, based on how these communities, individual needs are. And we have to recognize that and we have to understand that. And we have to listen to what these community needs actually are. So, you know, um, that means that we might have to make an, um, a, an, an adjustment of some kind, uh, you know, to, um, uh, to our plans in, in motion, essentially. Uh, so, uh, with that said, he does talk about Medicare for all. Uh, if, if there was Medicare for all, the shape of this crisis would be different is, is a quote that he said. And I think he might be talking about, um, uh, just that curve. Everybody talks about flattening that curve kind of a thing. Um, and uh, same thing, nationalizing the healthcare system. Uh, one of the things that is a little bit different than what, than what Howie talks about is investing in communities, like having ho more hospitals and clinics available in communities. He addresses food deserts. Um, they're trying to invest healthier foods uh, in, in especially low-income communities of colors. Uh, like basically a food desert, if you don't know what that is, is where there's no essential food, right? So... Uh, there's no like fresh produce. There's no uh, real foods in the area. It's a lot of like uh, top ramen Doritos, uh, pops, that sort of stuff. Uh, those aren't real foods. They're 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 fun to have every once in a while. Like you know, I like to enjoy myself a good soda and, and a bag of chips every once in a while. But you know, you got you got to get your vegetables in. You got to get your 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 fruits. Your your uh, you know, if you're if you're a fan of dairy, good dairy products in. You got to get. Uh, something real. And, and a lot of these communities, especially low income communities, don't have that sort of stuff. They will have a McDonald's there. They will have these fast food restaurants, which are essentially uh, garbage food. Uh, they are they are poisons. <laughs> uh, that's essentially what they are. Um, but but so when we talk about healthcare, when we talk about Medicare for all, when we talk about these initiatives, Dario's plan is to um, include a healthy food initiative uh, to improve these low income communities to make sure that there is a grocery store there where they can get good fresh produce, 
Uh, and I think that's an important part of the conversation. And again, this is part of the conversation that the only person on that debate stage that I remember watching that addressed the health, like eating healthy as part of the healthcare debate was fucking Marianne Williamson, man. <laughs> <laughs> which which does kind of entertain the shit out of me is is that like Marion Williamson and the Green Party yeah okay so if you're a Marion Williamson fan there you go yeah, you got Howie Hawkins talking about the child care stuff that she talked about and you got Dario Hunter talking about uh health care uh and if you're going to talk about Medicare for all and a universal health care system you need to talk about having healthy foods in our communities as well um so I think that's really cool uh and again there you go. You know, Marianne fans, if you were kind of disillusioned, she, she gave Marianne Williamson, um, you know, endorsed Bernie Sanders. And, uh, and then we saw Bernie Sanders disappointingly endorse fucking Joe Biden. And if you're a Marianne Williamson fan, that was like, cool, we got a Bernie endorsement. Uh, and then saw that and you were disappointed and were lost like a lot of other people. Boom. Fucking Dario Hunter, Howie Hawkins talking about this shit. So this is something that I do want to look at, and I don't know if we have, a, we're, we're at an hour 20, and that's a bit long, uh, but I did want to look at this. Uh, he has something called the uh, People of Color Bill of Rights. I want to take a look at that real quick. We'll run through a couple of them. Uh, the first one being a right to equal access to justice, including freedom from police brutality, racial profiling, um, and form of targeted dis proportionate mass incarceration. Uh, yes, 100%. Uh, I agree with that. This is, it, as I was reading through this too, this is kind of an important note um, to, to address here too, is a lot of what Dario has is this people of color bill of rights also goes back to the Black Panther Party. The Black Panther Party had a, a 10 point, uh, essentially like you could call it a list of demands, but they were, I mean, it was kind of a bill of rights. They were essentially like, this is what the, what the communities of color deserve. And a, a lot of what he's talking about here, uh, I think comes from the black Panther party itself, uh, comes from that 10 point statements that they made, uh, that Bobby seal and, uh, Hugh P Newton originally came up with, uh, the second one, a, a right to a truly equal, uh, quality, not-for-profit, local, community-controlled education system that values diversity and the histories of people of color. Yeah, we talked about that. Again, the education system is um, immensely corrupt. We talked about how Texas, uh, school, the Texas Board of Education basically uh, controls a, a lot of what the history textbooks have to say. Um, and uh, and it's uh, how many people really know about the Black Panther Party? How many people really know about the true history of Native Americans in this country? Um, Hell, even when I was going through my citizenship ceremony, the uh, the faces of immigrants were nothing past fucking 1941. And most of those immigrants were were like European immigrants. I didn't see an African immigrant in there. I didn't see a, a, a fucking Middle Easterner. I didn't see Southeast Asia. I didn't see Indian people represented in there. It was just like 1941. That's when uh, we pretty much had it right with immigration. We got a bunch of Europeans, and that's pretty much it, <laughs> right? Like, it's it's this weird, um, these subtle levels of of propaganda. We don't really have an accurate sense of um, real education, and that's because history is, uh, uh, you know, as as uh, some of you might know, is is written by the winners, as they say, and uh, you know, um, I I think uh, I think that that trend needs to stop. Uh, number three, a right to uh, genuine recognition of sovereignty of Native American peoples, uh, unabridged by illegal disregard for treaties, including uh, reparative process and recognition of sacred lands. Uh, yeah, and that goes back to uh, protesting pipelines. Um, they were trying to build a pipeline through a sacred lands, and I think that should not be allowed. There should be mutual respect. Uh, which is going to mean that corporations have to rein themselves in and not make money off of, uh, you know, other people's fucking land. Uh, this manifest destiny of corporations needs to probably stop. Uh, number four, a right to uh, be free from profit-driven targeting of minority communities for environmental hazards uh, and health neglect enforced by targeted government protection for health and well-being of people of color. Boom. That kind of goes into the last one. Uh, last thing that we talked about here, 
Uh, number five, a right to a comprehensive reparative effort, uh, i.e. reparations, to address 400 years of slavery and discrimination against uh, Americans of African descent. Yeah, bit of a bit of a complicated subject. Um, I, I I I don't know exactly how uh, to um, address that appropriately. Um, Marianne Williams also kind of had a plan of that. I know I've mentioned her a couple times in this video, but there are some real similarities. Uh, you know, it's like there's a bunch of similarities from Bernie's camp, a bunch of similarities from uh, Andrew Yang's. I think better. Uh, their their UBI ideas are way fucking better than Andrew Yang's. Um, but you know, a bunch of similarities from Mary Ann Williamson. So really, these political alternatives do have a place to go. And there's a lot of political people. You know, the people that believe in these alternative quote unquote alternative political ideologies. Um, I said this before is um, part of the reparations thing to, for me is I don't know if financially um, giving money, I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't do that. I think that should be a part of it, but I don't know if that's the only thing um, that, uh, that it requires. There's a history of institutionalized racism. There is a history of xenophobia in this country. Um, and, you know, financial reparations might not be the only way to solve it. It might it might be taken um, as an excuse to kind of look the other way for all those things. Um, really, to me, this comprehensive uh, reparative effort is all of it, is all of it, um, is making sure that, you know, the, the, the racist police system is taken care of, is respecting indigenous people's lands, is making sure uh, that everybody gets a fair shake, is, is making sure that people don't get... Uh, lose their jobs because of the color of their skin or who they choose to love or any of that sort of stuff. Uh, um, right. So as we keep going, a, a right to be free from uh, forms of colonialism, including political and economic colonialism, uh, whether in our territories uh, or abroad, a right to be free from wage slavery, a right to government protection from predatory financial practices on people of color, uh, a, a right for a fair opportunity for normalized documented immigrant status or citizenship without discrimination due to race, ethnicity, or national origin. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, this, this is another thing that I think really differentiates, um, Howie Hawkins from, uh, Dario Hunter is I think Dario has, uh, a lot more, uh, ideas on addressing sort of that racial, uh, that institutionalized racial discrimination, uh, so again, something that I kind of like, um, so I, I know the video is kind of running a little bit long. Sorry that the today is, is a little, little longer. I kind of wanted to go a little bit more in depth about, uh, you know, the green party candidates so that we have, we have a, 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 a decent, well-rounded view on both of the candidates. Um, so as we move on, uh, Dario talks about getting younger people on board because to him, he saw a lot of people when he was, you know, participating with the green party itself, uh, there, there weren't a lot of people that looked like him, uh, essentially he, you know, a, a uh, mixed race LGBTQ, uh, member of the LGBTQ community, a, a, you know, um, younger person. There were a lot of these older white folks that were there and, and again, nothing to just, credit against that i we need everybody on board with these movements but you know a little uh, diversity is always a good thing uh, you know so uh, what what he wanted to see was was more younger people get on board and i think uh to and and this is what he says is he just wants like younger people want to see people that are proactive to their causes like younger people and and this goes to kind of like the stuff that i've been really talking about is i think you should vote with your belief system intact you shouldn't have to give up on a, on a belief system just to vote for the lesser of two evils, right? Um, you should vote with your belief system intact. You should be more active. Uh, at, you should be participating more actively in your in your in your republic. Uh, and moving forward, what he wants to do is ensure that this agenda of dividing people is not part of any sort of political movement. Uh, Again, we talk about how do we overcome these third party blocks, uh, ranked choice voting, uh, trying to implement that and and kind of pushing uh, that idea forward. Uh, and I, like I said, I'm gonna talk more about ranked choice voting in, in maybe a week or so as a part of, a, of the Friday videos that I do. Uh, 
it, essentially, ranked choice voting would block this notion of private funding of elections, right? Like, you, you can't just privately keep funding elections. Uh, ranked choice voting is... Uh, so let's say there are four candidates that, that are in place. Let's say it's just, for, you know, uh, you got Joe Biden, Donald Trump, Dario Hunter, and uh, Gary Johnson, because I'm not sure who's running in the Libertarian Party, and I need to do more research about that. But let's say Gary Johnson, those are your options. And, you know, out of all of the votes, you see, you know, Dario, Joe Biden, Trump, and then Gary Johnson. And then you kind of just levy it out and to see who's getting what. And if and if it ends up, it's it's not as complicated as it sounds. I'm not doing a very good job of, of describing it. <laughs> but you rank who you want to vote for, essentially, right? Like, so... If if Dario's your number one, you, you and then then they count how many number ones Dario got, and then they count how many number twos Dario got, right? So it, 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 Ireland does it uh, again. It makes you more active in your in your democracy. It makes it makes your your democracy a lot less corruptible. Uh, he also talks about how finances are used to to block the Green Party. How the uh, the Democratic Party will go ahead and use a lot of uh, financial tactics to block third parties, but I mean, both the parties do Republicans and Democrats do. Um, so, you know, kind of getting around these financial blocks and ensuring that people know about it for one, people know that the DNC is a private corporation that controls our elections. Um, and the more people know about it, the, the better it is. Right. So, uh, the final thing that he talks about, uh, is Assange and, and press freedoms. Um, currently, Assange is still in Belmarsh prison uh, after he served out his his sentence for that bullshit bail, escaping the bail or whatever that they, they tried to get him on. Um, and, and he says that, uh, you know, there's a couple things that he brings up because he, he does have a, a, a legal background, right? He's he was a lawyer. Um, uh, so he does have that is. The charges that they're bringing him up on the, the this Espionage Act charge is bogus, and um, oh, they're saying, "Oh, you're protecting. You can't protect your sources. We don't know if these are right sources. You put a bunch of people in danger, even though nobody's died from what he's revealed. Uh, what he's revealed is is actually uh, good, like positive. It, it it should yield positive changes. And journalists have used all his shit, like the New York Times, the Guardian." Um, Der Spiegel, like they've all fucking used everything Julian Assange has printed in WikiLeaks, uh, has revealed. They've all used him as a source. And and what they're accusing Julian Assange of, other journalists do that shit too. Like they also protect their sources. They also have anonymity for their sources. Like, so why are you not going after them? So this kind of opens up a big can of worms, right? So if you're a journalistic source, if you're, if you're, and you want to remain anonymous, you might not be able to do that if they convict Julian Assange, uh, which is a problem. You might not be able to have anonymous sources uh, as a journalist, which is a problem. And it's in violation of international law uh, because basically he's, uh, what Dario brings up is that international law is broken because he, uh, Julian Assange had Ecuadorian citizenship. And uh, that was given by Rafael Correa. Um, last year, I did a very extensive look into Assange's uh, relationship with uh, the country of Ecuador under Rafael Correa and under uh, the current president, Leda Moreno. Um, and Moreno took his citizenship away without any sort of legal reason, any sort of like, you know, uh, he just kind of snapped his fingers and said no more citizenship. There was no, um, there, there was no litigation behind it. And that allowed the, the UK police to go in and literally fucking drag him out of prison, uh, which is not, which is illegal, right? Like you can't just dissolve somebody's citizenship like that. And you can't just go in and pull them out of uh, asylum. So they broke international law in doing this. Um, all because, you know, he went against the U.S. empire. And the question that people need to, in my opinion, people need to be concerned about is probably what happens when you make a statement about the U.S. empire that the empire doesn't like. Can they 
just snap their fingers and say no more citizenship? That kind of seems fucked up and authoritarian. That doesn't seem like what a, uh, a representative democracy would do. Um, you know, that doesn't that doesn't seem like how democracy should be represented. He also uh, calls for an end to uh, just a regular warfare, the the standard wars that we get into. You know, the uh, the classic hot wars. Um, and the economic wars, but with all the sanctions that we see, um, we 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 have seen tons and tons of sanctions uh, all across uh, the world. Uh, there are still sanctions on Venezuela. There are sanctions on Nicaragua, Iran, Iraq, Syria, Yemen. Um, during a pandemic, when most of the most of the world is calling for a ceasefire, um, this is not the way you go about handling a situation like this. So Dari Hunter would would call for you know. Basically, an end to all of that. Basically, a new again. His his notion is to create a diplomatic realignment. Um, so, all in all, if uh, if I may be make a bold statement, to me, I, I kind of like Dario's policies a little bit more. But I, but again, I, I don't dislike what Howie Hawkins has to say either. Um, I think the the two of them together could could really make a good. Um, good force a good, you know good collaboration um bring bring very interesting and bold ideas together um in my opinion i like dario's personality a little bit more like i said it's a it's a little bit more compassionate it's a little bit more understanding um it's less stern uh than than howie's is so i i i prefer that personality in in terms of leadership a little bit more um so i i think that you know the I like what both of them have to say. There are certain things that I would probably uh, disagree with. Um, then, um, and that's good. You should be able to disagree with the people that you support. You should be able to disagree with your leadership. That's that's how you hold uh, leadership in uh, you know a, a, a lot more accountable. But uh, that is where we're going to close things off. Let's look at some uh, some comments. Mike, thank you. I, I'm. Uh, uh, I wanted to make sure that I covered this. I'm not the only one talking about this sort of stuff. Uh, Lee Camp is, is, has has done some really great stuff talking to uh, Green Party members, Ron Placone, Graham Elwood, Jimmy Dore. They all kind of uh, talk about this stuff as well. So uh, uh, I'm sure you guys know who they are. Uh, it, it would be very strange if you found me and didn't know any of those other <laughs> far bigger uh, lefty progressive voices. Uh, Mark, take no, no. That's that's what I say on your live streams, Mark. <laughs> uh, Cindy, I, I agree. The country has been held back uh, by arrogance of people thinking there's no need to improve. Yes, that is part of the. Pro yeah, I I think. Uh, which is so funny because the um, the slogan of the right is. Uh, is make America great again, uh, you know, and and if you need to make it great, like, doesn't that go against that hubris, that arrogance, that America is the best all the time? <laughs> like, it doesn't fucking make sense. Um, our final comment, uh, how do people overlook the fact that we have a privately funded campaign but won't recognize oligarchy? How contradictory does everything get before we can deny it? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's difficult. Uh, people, the, the human brain is a fascinating, uh, organ, uh, you know, I, uh, I don't know. I don't know. It, it's very troublesome. Um, I try to be patient with people. I try to have these sort of, uh, discussions, this sort of discourse, uh, you know, as much as I possibly can and, um, just try to stay as patient as I possibly can with people, let them, absorb the information and process it in the way that they need to process it. Cause everybody's not going to, uh, accept these, these, these realities, uh, all in the same way. Um, it is very much like 1984 and it's, it's, <laughs> it's hard, but you know, and that, and it's also a brave new world, right. Where, where we have an overload of, um, of information and there's so much content and there's so much noise. How do you kind of just fight through it and find the right pieces of information? 
Uh, what information can you trust? And, and, and it can get difficult, especially when you haven't been paying attention to all of this stuff. It becomes very daunting. And I think that was part of the snap of 2016 is everybody realizing, holy shit, we are now going to have to pay attention. We are now going to have to participate. We are now going to have to not be distracted by the real housewives of wherever the fuck and actually like be a part of this governing system. Make sure that we hold our leaders accountable. Actually support activism. That's so much work. And we have our jobs and we have our families. We have this, that. And it's and it becomes very daunting. I was talking to a friend about this earlier today. It becomes very daunting. It becomes um you know, very difficult to deal with. But um, the more we have these sort of discussions, the more we kind of have these conversations, the more we look at bold change and bold reform to move forward, not make a choice to take a whole step backwards so that we can arrive back here again in another four to eight years. Um, and then say, boy, how did we get back here again? You know, is is to say, let's not come out of this uh current situation that we're in and take a few steps backwards, but take one or two steps forward. L let's look at what those 10 steps ahead are um, and really make the choice to be actively participating um, in that change, actively participating in that piece of legislation, right? being in the know, understanding what some of these ideas are going to be. Um, so, yeah, I think critical thinking is very important in our uh, current society. And I hope that we come out of this being more compassionate, intelligent, critical thinkers. Uh, that is that is my hope. And with that said, we are concluding today's live stream. Uh, these are getting longer. Uh, I <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry making you guys sit through like fucking an hour and 30, 40, 50 minutes of <laughs> content. Uh, I am a long winded son of a bitch. I am fully aware of that. Uh, but uh, thank you guys for um, hanging out. Thank you guys for leaving comments. Uh, as always, if you have, uh, you know, if you have the means to, you can donate. You can become a sustaining member. You can make a one-time donation. That is not abs it is it is not a necessity. We're all getting through this shit together. All of my content will be available for free, uh, all the time for you to enjoy. Uh, but please make sure that you share, get this out to as many people as you can. Uh, content like this is often suppressed and not shown to, uh, to people. I am not uh, the corporate technocracy's favorite. Uh, and uh, the, the, the more people that kind of see this stuff, the, the, the better it is and the more conversations we can have um, like this, more, more discourse in my opinion. So um, with that said, uh, last bit of news, uh, my album, my new album is gonna be coming out soon. I will talk uh, uh, at length and in detail about that on a, on a future live stream, I guess. Um, as it gets closer, but June 1st, I'm going to be dropping my new album, Politely Angry, um, and uh, it'll be available on all of the streaming and downloading platforms, particularly Bandcamp, uh, where there will be two different versions of the album. There will be the main album and then like a bonus version uh, with alternative cuts and things of that sort. Um, and, uh, you know, a bunch of bonus stuff that's going to be available on my Bandcamp page. Uh, so, uh, and it's also, um, uh, pay what you want. That's what it is. It's pay what you want, uh, which basically means it'll be out for free on Bandcamp. So if, if you're going through a tough time, but you still want to check out some live stand up comedy, uh, from yours truly, it's going to be avail a available as pay what you want. All my albums right now on Bandcamp are available as pay what you want. So you can go and uh, download them for free and, and enjoy them at your leisure. Uh, a, so, so there's that. Um, I am gonna be doing some Zoom comedy shows. I'm gonna be, I'm doing a test. Next Saturday, I'm going to be, um, I'm gonna be running a test show uh, with a very limited number of people. I'm gonna have 10 people in a Zoom uh, thing. I'm going to, uh, you know, do a little bit of material, kind of talk about 
a little bit of the formatting that I want to try to do and then uh, basically do a little Q and A. So it'll be like 30, 40 minutes to, 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 to do that. Tickets are available for that now. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll get all 10, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get 10 people to just jump in. It's free. The test show is going to be free. And then from that, I'll probably figure out when I want to try to do um, a live Zoom show, like a full out live Zoom show. It'll probably be 45 minutes to an hour. Maybe we'll do a little Q&A session at the end, kind of chit chat a little bit. Um, it'll be five bucks to get tickets for that. Uh, if you're a sustaining member, um, I will. You you don't have to pay for it. And uh, the other thing too, uh, because everybody's kind of going through a tough time, uh, the tickets will be limited to twenty at first. But if even f like I understand that sometimes five bucks even is a a lot, especially in trying times, especially in uh, a, a, a time where we're all quarantined, where some of us have lost all our income. If you want to check out the show and you're in a precarious situation, feel free to message me and I will give you a code that you can put in um, to get, uh, you know, a, a, a uh, free ticket, hopefully, uh, to either the, the, whenever the show, whenever the date for the show is decided. Uh, or a future date or something along those lines. So uh, be on the lookout for that. But the test show uh, has 10 spots free. Tickets are available for that. I will put a link to that in the comments section uh, so you can check out uh, check that out uh, in just a few minutes. Um, and I think that's it. Videos will be uh, every single day. I'm putting out videos. So make sure you're subscribed to the channel. Make sure you're subscribed to the uh, to the page. And uh, yeah, thank you guys uh, for tuning in. Thank you guys for being awesome. Thank you guys for uh, leaving comments. Uh, until the next time, we'll see you on the road. Take care of yourselves. Bye.